Uh, welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, my name's Linda Connor and I'll be chairing the session. We've got uh, only one hour, 60 minutes, so we have to keep strictly to time. Um, and we have 10 minutes, the, the format is 10 minutes uh, for each presenter. We have three presenters and then we will open it up to uh, discussion and questions from the floor and hope we can generate uh, a good discussion in the last half hour. Our uh, topic for this keynote conversation is just transition and I think you'll agree we've got three uh, really interesting speakers to uh, kick it off. So the first person I'd like to introduce to you is uh, Blair Palese and Blair is the CEO of 350 .org Australia. So I'll hand over to you. Okay, great. Hi everyone, thanks for being here on the last, you know, fading hours of the conference. I came at the start, it was really good to hear some of the international speakers and their perspectives. Um, I put together a bunch of slides. I am definitely not an academic, I'm much more of an activist, uh, but I thought I'd just throw uh, kind of the scene as it is in Australia out in front of you in some slides, um, and then me and my lovely um, expert speakers would really like to have a discussion about where to from here and where we find inspiration to kind of, you know, rally the troops, get active, and really make a difference knowing the kind of things we're up against here in Australia. So, and that's what we're up against. This is coal, oil, and gas under lease around Australia. So if you think it's gonna be an easy job to talk people out of uh, wrapping up fossil fuels, transitioning to the great, fantastic clean energy future, every one company involved in that is pretty much gonna do everything they can to try and stop us from making progress on this. So we're gonna to have to get pretty creative. Uh, we're gonna to have to look for some market-based ideas that we can sell, and we're going to have to work together across sectors with workers in communities uh, and with progressive industry. Uh, one of the next speakers is gonna talk in detail about Hazelwood, but it's um, unbelievably kind of one of our best case scenarios in Australia because we actually did close the plant it was the most polluting plant we had in Australia, and it was one of the worst in the world. Brown coal burning, uh, a massive fire that had impact on the, the entire community uh, that went on for months and months. Uh, hearings across the state about what those impacts were and what they should do. Uh, but in the end, it was closed, and they are moving to other things, and they're trying to find ways to progress. There has been some funding through state and federal to help them do that. Uh, but it's, it's definitely been a haphazard process and an example of why we need a national transition plan. So I'm not going to dwell on any of these details. It's just to kind of give you a sense of how big some of our challenges are and where examples of specific cases are around the country. New South Wales is one of the largest mining places in the world, and Newcastle, the port of Newcastle, is the biggest shipping terminal for coal in the world. So again, we're up against trying to convince people of a whole new economy of scale if we're gonna move from fossil fuels into other things. Um, I didn't wanna to dwell too much on New South Wales, but if you've ever seen pictures or had a chance to fly over uh, the area around the Hunter Valley in particular, which has been beautiful farm country, uh, horse breeding, uh, wine, best known for some of their beautiful reds, uh, and yet we have destroyed huge portions of it, mostly through coal, but also through coal seam gas. And the impacts on the communities, and there are dozens of them, some of them quite large, uh, are growing, uh, they're ongoing, and the remediation picture that we're painting there for what happens after that's all done and companies pack up and leave is a really big concern on the justice side. Because invariably what's happened in Australia is that there's talk of bonds, there's talk of remediation money and regulations, but more often than not, the company drills every dollar of coal or gas out of the ground, goes bankrupt and leaves. So we taxpayers end up picking up the cost of the remediation or it doesn't get done at all. 
So communities that have benefited to a small degree through jobs often are left with no way to repair that land and turn it into something that could be used again. You've probably heard a bit about the Adani Carmichael Mine. It's, I've just put it up there because here we are in 2017 thinking about taking on yet another mine, and it's the biggest one in Australia, it would be, and it would be the biggest one in our region in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, in 2017, after Paris, you may scratch your head and say, how could we? I certainly do every day, and most of my waking hours are spent looking for creative ways to stop this coal mine, uh, both the funding, but also the idea of another coal mine, because at this point in time, it's time to get our heads around the idea that we have to move on from coal, and we have to find new ways to produce jobs for people in far away regions. So one of the interesting challenges about this mine uh, is that the, the only supporter for the mine in the world at this very moment in time, besides Adani, is our federal government, and to a smaller degree, the Queensland government. Uh, and so with no global investors, the chance that this mine might happen will be exclusively on the shoulders of the, our Australian federal government. So taxpayers would be supporting another giant coal mine when it's clear from polling after polling they don't want more coal, they don't want the Adani coal mine, uh, and they're not being listened to. There are 180 Stop Adani groups around the country in faraway places like Tasmania and WA, uh, and this campaign is ramped up in a period of five months like nothing I've ever seen in Australia. So I, I'm not going to bore you with how tragic it's been, but it's been tragic in Australia on the leadership front on climate change and specifically on the just transition side. Because if you're going to deny that it's happening uh, and you're going to win votes and convince people that we don't have to worry about climate change, it's very difficult to develop any strategies for how you make the transition, and that's pretty much what Australia has done. We don't have a plan. Uh, we're not investing in helping communities and workers to the next stage, and we're not looking at how we manage the health impacts. And the Paris failure commitment-wise is maybe, you know, the saddest thing is that we actually signed it and there was a flurry of optimism that we might actually do something. We now look to be one of the worst in the world at the bond meeting currently going on uh, in, on the UN talks front. Meanwhile, in our region, we're seeing increased weather impacts of all kinds, in, in particular cyclones, but uh, sea level rise is really causing whole countries and communities to look at what they're going to do to survive. Uh, we work with a network of Pacific Islanders at 350 who are over in Bonn. That's them with their Stop Adani banner this week uh, in Germany with a message for the UN and for the federal government of Australia that we can't keep pretending that we don't play a critical role in the impacts in our region of fossil fuels and continuing to pursue them. So there's a real justice element in our region of being a leader and being a developed country that's benefited, obviously, from the development of coal, oil, and gas over you know, more than a century. But what it's doing is killing our neighbors. And Southeast Asia and the Pacific seems to be the likeliest to be the hardest hit in the world. And they're the people who've done the least to deserve the impacts. Again, I'm not, I don't need to talk through all of this, but we face in Australia possibly one of the most unique challenges of how to address climate change uh, in the world because we're so addicted to fossil fuels, both economically using them uh, for exports, and it's just ingrained in our culture that we will make money from mining. So our biggest companies uh, literally can take out prime ministers on the basis of a threatened tax. They have power they wield every day. Uh, that means that we ignore environmental regulations, that we give subsidies, that we are willing to think about a billion dollar loan to an Indian coal mining company. Uh, it's owned by a billionaire. Uh, the logic of inaction on climate in this country is clearly dictated by uh, the influence of the mining industry and coal, oil and gas in particular. I just throw this up. This is a quote from the mayor in, uh, around Hazelwood who you know, has suffered through the lack of a plan. And what she expressed during that time was that one of the things people felt the most fearful about was having no idea about what next. 
and just allaying the fears of the community by suggesting that was, there might have been a plan before the thing actually closed um, would have helped people in the community adapt and adjust. And it, it really, there was a whole hiding of uh, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, and that that played psychologically uh, from a transition point of view on the community all the time, like throughout the whole process and for the years before. Urgency. I, I think early on the first day, I, I, someone asked a question about, you know, what do you do if people aren't acting? Um, I, I don't think the answer is wait and get patient because change will come. We don't have the time to waste anymore. We have some scientists say three years, some say 10 to act on climate and shift our energy use from fossil fuels to clean energy and to reduce emissions drastically. It's something we've never been able to do before and the challenge is before us with political will simply not there. So I just wrap up with where to, where do we go in Australia? And there are lots of things we can do, lots of things we should do, but I think we can't count on a federal government acting uh, in the interest of our future. So we need to find creative ways to go around our federal government, to work in coalition with progressive thinkers, communities, mayors, councils, uh, unions that actually get climate change and are ready to talk about what our options are. And we need to step up and act. So one of the challenges for groups like 350 is to help build a movement that's big enough that we can't be ignored and that action can be taken. So it's not an optimistic point of view uh, politically, but it is optimistic uh, nationally if you think about how many people in Australia just think we should get on with it and are willing to go there. So I think we have a lot to offer if we get active. If we don't, we will be a pariah country for years to come as we faced what I think is probably the biggest threat of our time. And economically, we have the opportunity to make it a benefit to our economy if we can transition and change or to suffer if we don't. So I hope that your discussions throughout the conference have helped come up with some good creative ideas because we're gonna need them and we're gonna need them very, very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Blair. That was a great uh, opening overview. Uh, our next speaker is Bronya Lipsky. Uh, Bron yeah, Bronya is a lawyer with the Environmental Justice Australia organisation. Thanks. Hi, I'm Bronya Lipsky. I am a lawyer at Environmental Justice Australia. For those of you who are not aware of who Environmental Justice Australia is, we're a not-for-profit community legal centre that specialises in environmental protection law. We used to be the Victorian Environmental Defender's Office um, and we rejigged our um, funding strategies and, and the type of work that we're doing, particularly in the wake of having lost all of our federal funding courtesy of the coalition government when they got into power a few years ago. Um, I'm going to talk about what does a just transition mean for a community like the Latrobe Valley um, and put three provocations on the table about, you know, we, we talk about a just transition, but what does it actually look like on the ground for a community such as the Latrobe Valley, which is very unique in Australia in that it has for nearly 100 years supplied Victoria with um, the, the majority of its power. Um, it has three enormous brown coal mines. Um, brown coal, you can't export it, so basically you have to build the power station directly next to the mine in order to be able to utilise the resource. Um, and it's, it's an area that's been in transition for a, a nearly 30 years since the power industry was privatised in Victoria, so whilst the, the now former mayor Kelly O'Callaghan might talk about there's no there was no plan for transition and the Victorian and state uh, Victorian and federal governments have wrung their hands talking about oh we, we haven't planned for this what are we going to do about it let's throw on these sort of band-aid um, initiative to try and get the the region moving um, have actually known for quite some time that the energy sector is going to be moving away from coal-fired power generation um, so there was not really any in some ways there wasn't really any kind of excuse to not have a transition plan at least 10 years ago for an area like the Latrobe Valley. 
Um, so the first provocation that I'd like to put on the table is the idea that the, the, the government initiatives um, and funding initiatives and union initiatives have all focused on worker transition and what it means, um, at, at sort of putting the urgency on, on transitioning workers at, who've worked in the mines or worked in the power stations or what are we going to do with these guys because they've lost their income for their families and um, the, the, contra the, the contractors and subcontractors and what we can do for those people and support them through, a, a, through transition. It's, which is important. Like, the, of course, these people are losing their jobs. They need to transition into different forms of employment. They might be part of, a, of the energy transition um, initiative that's taking part in Australia and globally. Um, but it totally neglects the um, a historical regional development of transition. Um, there's a focus on new coal projects, for instance, in La Travelle, the local government and the National Party of Victoria and even the Liberal government of Victoria, the coalition, um, the Minerals Council of Australia and the peak um, business group in the La Trobe Valley, the committee for Gippsland are all sort of focused on utilising the resource and building a new coal-fired power station. That's going to be the way that we transition workers in the La Trobe Valley. Um, the energy sector in the Latrobe Valley is by no means the um, greatest source of employment um, in the Latrobe Valley either. That's the health sector. So there's no, there's already a, 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 an imbalance between what does transition look like for the region when um, the region's not totally dependent on energy production, but it's, it's, its regional identity is so caught up in the idea that we're energy producers and this is what we contribute to, um, to the state is, is, is not just. It, 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 it neglects the however many tens of thousands of people that don't work in the sector and don't rely on that as that primary means of employment or um, or income. So that's one idea that this this focus on workers is not necessarily a, a just approach to what a transition looks like. Um, the second provocation, though, of course, is that there is a history of energy production in an area like the Latrobe Valley. Um, there's, before the industry was privatised, there was a lot of resource and development that was put into how to how to create electricity, how to better better ways to dig coal out of the ground, all those types of things. And the Latrobe Valley is unique in that it's it's all the the means of the, the infrastructure, the, the energy distribution infrastructure is all there. So you've, it comes directly out of the power stations and goes out into the grids, out into New South Wales, over to Tasmania and into South Australia. So, in a way, that there is no reason why the Latrobe Valley can't be the centre in Australia for the renewable energy transition um, and forms of. Uh, grid transition and, and, and electricity market transition and all those types of things, which is not actually happening in Australia um, in, a, in a way with the type of urgency that we need to be able to combat climate change um, in, in a meaningful way. So whilst this, this place is, is potentially going to be left behind like it was 30 years ago when the industry was privatised, it's, it's possibly again going to be left um, to the side in the talk of renewable energy transitions, despite the fact that it's, it's basically got everything there ready to go to be the centre of it in Australia, um, from transitioning workers to new forms of, of energy production to utilising the infrastructure that's already there um, to contribute meaningfully to, to shifting the... Uh, shifting of our reliance on fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy and what that might look like um, nationally. The third provocation I'd like to put out there is the, um, the increasing environmental justice issues uh, in the Latrobe Valley f as we transition away from the reliance on fossil fuel generation in somewhere like the Latrobe Valley. So um, there's, and this is where I do a lot of my work, and I, I probably should have mentioned earlier that I, I am a lawyer with Environmental Justice Australia. I work a lot with the Latrobe Valley community on these types of issues and particularly around procedural environmental justice issues. I'm also from the Latrobe Valley, so this work is quite um, personal as well as, is, as it is professional for me. And it's something that I have been thinking about for a good couple of decades now. And I think that there, there's a, a momentum building in the Latrobe Valley to, to really get these things going. Um, the industry is leaving behind a, 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 a an enormous environmental justice issue though. So a lot of the work that I'm doing is around air pollution and air pollution law reform from coal-fired power stations and the, and the impact on people's health um, and the way that the people in the Latrobe Valley have always borne this air pollution burden and the health impacts from that. Um, 
there's legacy contamination issues from the mines and from the power stations as well, whether that's uh, water contamination, groundwater contamination in particular, land contamination. Um, there's a huge amount of asbestos in the region. I think the Latrobe Valley has one of the highest rates of mesothelioma and other asbestos-related diseases um, in Australia, and that's directly as a result of, of mining and power production down there. Um, and then there's the legacy issues around ash ponds and, again, land and water contamination. Um, there's also the, the huge elephants in the room there, which are these enormous mines and the need to rehabilitate these mines, particularly as you can't actually export the coal so it can be useful for in other ways. Um, there's a lot of talk about, and, and predominantly mine rehabilitation in Australia focuses around pit lakes and, the, and filling the, the, these enormous voids with water, which is an environmental justice issue, it's a resource distribution issue, it's um, a climate change issue because we're talking about hundreds and like billions of, of megalitres of water to fill basically a, a private problem. Um, and then all the issues around land subsidy, uh, subsidence, and all the types of things that, that mine rehabilitation brings up with it. The, the need for the community to be able to utilise these voids in some kind of way that's meaningful to them, not just from a regional identity perspective, but also from a, an economic perspective. Um, there have been some developments in Victoria around increasing the bonds for mine rehabilitation, for instance, but those conversations took place after a mine literally caught on fire and was like blowing toxic smoke over a community for 45 days. Um, and two quasi-judicial inquiries that were a result of that that eventually um, saw the development of the increase of bonds for mine rehabilitation uh, in the Latrobe Valley. Um, but what, is a, what does a just transition look like in the context of environmental justice as well? So what do you do when, these, when the mining companies move away, where the, the huge environmental um, non-government organisations move away after the power stations are closed and no one's talking about how you fix up the, the fact that you might not be able to utilise the water or grow crops anymore. Um, so just transition is, is very complicated for a community like the Latrobe Valley and I thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to highlight some of the complexities, um, albeit very briefly, and I absolutely welcome any discussion on how these complexities can start to be resolved in a just way by, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room that have been turning their minds to this type of thing. I would love to talk with you and continue this conversation later on, so thank you very much. Thanks, Bronya. Our third uh, presenter is Tom Reddington. Tom is with Union Aid Abroad, and he's an organiser for climate justice and energy democracy with that organisation. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> uh, before I get going, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation as the traditional owners of the land, and also acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Also like to acknowledge the leadership that um, First Nation groups in Australia and also across the globe are playing and leading the climate justice movement. Uh, so I'm Tom and I'm the climate justice and energy democracy organiser at Unionate Abroad Feeder. Unionate Abroad Feeder is the global justice organisation of the Australian Union movement. Um, we have a number of offices across the Asia Pacific region and work in solidarity with trade unions and other allied movements in their struggle for substantive democracy, economic justice, women's rights, migrant rights, and um, increasingly climate justice. Uh, climate change is union business, um, and I think this is really illustrated in now region uh, looking at the impact that heat stress is having right now on workers. Uh, in Cambodia, where we have an office, um, uh, provides a really, really great example. Uh, heat stress is making work more precarious, and it's making work more precarious, especially for uh, workers, low-income earning workers. And in a country like Cambodia, workers like labourers, manufacturer, you know, manufacturer workers and agricultural workers make up over half of the workforce. Um, already, uh, and yeah, what heat stress, heat stress is doing is making work more precarious because the impact of heat is often um, a loss in productive work hours 
for workers in these sorts of industries, this results in a, a, lock, a, a loss in income as they're often paid based on labour um, executed or by the hour. So already, for example, in Cambodia, workers have lost 2.8% of um, productive working time at current rates of global warming. Um, at businesses usual rates and quite conservative business as usual rates, this is looking to increase by a loss of 11% of productive working time uh, for workers by 2085. So what that means for workers in Cambodia is, is already they've lost one and a half weeks of available work time. Um, and uh, you know, at current rates, conservative rates of pollution, that's set to increase to uh, almost six weeks of lost productivity. Of course, this isn't taking into account um, you know, the many other severe impacts that are happening uh, right now, especially for workers in low-income communities in a country like Cambodia um, that are caused by the, by the climate crisis. So I guess that's just a bit of a, a background, I guess, in terms of how we as um, the Australian Union Movement's global justice arm is situating our work out using, a, I guess, a worker-centric lens to look at climate justice and increasingly energy democracy work. Um, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to speak uh, briefly about um, just transition and some of the work that Australian Union Movement, as well as internationally, has been done in that space. But I wanted to spend a lot more time talking about transformation and what I think um, is directing our emerging work, but also what um, increasingly unions are leading uh, in terms of the opportunity through energy democracy of community worker and, and public ownership of renewable energy systems and low carbon works. Um, so yeah, briefly on just transitions and um, picking up on uh, you know, the, the time that um, the other speakers have taken to speak a bit about some of the examples, especially the Latrobe Valley. Um, you know, clearly for workers in the fossil fuel industry, um, coal industry as well, you know, just transitions hasn't been a reality in Australia. Um, the privatised, deregulated energy system um, has failed to provide any sense of justice for, for workers. Um, the Latrobe Valley provides a great example and um, thanks for taking the time to take us through that. I think even, you know, Port Augusta in South Australia, like, there's been a great win, but there's been a great win because of a three-year hard-fought community campaign, community and union campaign, uh, to get the solar power station going there. Um, clearly, market solutions aren't, you know, helping planet nor people or workers. And, uh, yeah, and so I think... Um, looking at the Australian Council of Trade Unions platform, which is focused on um, the creation of a new statu statutory authority, um, which they're calling an energy transition authority, which would be um, fully funded, obviously, and sit across the environment and energy portfolios and work to realise three things, um, an or orderly and planned closure of coal, especially in Australia, redeployment and new, new employment opportunities in low carbon in industries for workers um, in, in that sector. And thirdly, uh, labour adjust adjustment and retraining, skilling and support for fossil fuel communities as well as workers um, to um, you know, undertake that change in their economies. There was, I guess, some um, example of this working after the closure of Hazelwood. Uh, through the Hazelwood Worker Transfer Scheme, which was some consolation with 150 workers being able to be transitioned, uh, rather, who were, who were made redundant of the 750, were able to be transferred to other power stations with predominantly $20 million that came from the state Labor government. Um, but I think, as, as the last speaker illustrated, you know, uh, too little, too late, and you know, a great policy failure, and I think failure of the imagination um, in the Latrobe Valley. On an international level, the International Trade Union Confederation has been fighting hard to realise just transition provision um, in, in, the, in the international framework. And um, as many people would know, in the um, COP21 Paris Agreement, there's a provision for a just transition that creates decent work and quality jobs. Um, you know, currently coming into the current COP, the ITUC is working hard to ensure that this is realised through um, encouraging countries to have just transition provision in their NDCs, continuing that dialogue at the COP level, 
and also um, green climate fund opportunities for just transition um, as well. Uh, but yeah, as I said earlier, what I was really keen to talk about today was, was, was not just the transition that, um, as, we've, as, as we all know, needs to happen, it needs to happen extremely urgently, but rather the transformation um, and the emerging opportunities of energy democracy through community, worker and public ownership as a response to obviously the climate crisis, but also the crisis of neoliberalism, the, the crisis of growing inequality. Um, and uh, energy democracy is providing a, an, an opportunity for, 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 for a new way of you know, organising our economies that benefit workers, low-income communities. Uh, and I think you know, a good example of, of this is looking at what's been happening in the UK recently with the Labor Party. You know, three years ago, if you said to someone in the Labor Party in the UK, um, you know, let's, let's nationalise the power industry, they'd say, you know, what have you been smoking type thing. Um, you know, in, the, in the latest election, Corbyn taking into a platform of nationalisation, putting power back in municipal community hands and transitioning to 100% renewable energy. And um, you know, to, to great success, they almost won the election. Um, so I think we've got a really exciting moment now with these twin crises and an opportunity to seize that and ensure, ensure that it works in, in the interests of, of, of community and, and workers. And so I want to offer two examples of this. One is in Australia and the other one is in the Philippines. Um, so in Australia, a, a number of unions, um, and especially the National Union of Workers, um, have been working for the last, well, I've been part of it, um, luckily, been working on the establishment of Cooperative Power Australia, which is a new co-op that was formed a couple of weeks ago with um, six unions and two civil society organisations uh, representing over 100,000 members. Um, and it currently has a plan to retail affordable and clean energy um, to, its, to its members um, as part of supporting all Australians to transition to a low carbon um, economy. And I just want to take a little bit of time to, and I'll be quick, just to read really briefly from the preamble of the cooperative, which is um, now a legal document that I'm excited about. Uh, to, to, I guess, illuminate some of, some of this focus. So the cooperative seeks to respond to, uh, one, dangerous human-induced global warming, two, a drastic decline in civil society participation and substantive democracy, and three, unprecedented and growing inequality. It aims to address these crises through, one, action to reduce carbon pollution in line to keep global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, ensure all communities um, can access clean air and healthy environments. Three, build and enhance civil society and membership organisation, sorry, two, build and enhance civil society and membership based organisations. And three, take back the commons and enable um, democratic ownership of energy systems and accessible electricity for all. Um, and this project comes from, uh, especially from National Union of Worker members who are involved in some of the most precarious work in Australia, um, working in uh, warehouses, food processing, agricultural workers, who, um, you know, to be honest, putting a price on carbon didn't work for these workers, it didn't engage them. Um, and, but, but uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they said to their unions that, that electricity prices was having a massive impact on their household budgets and they wanted their union to do something about it. About it. So it was seen that there's an opportunity to combine the, the way that fossil fuel corporations are ripping off workers, um, as well as you know, polluting, polluting the planet, in order to bring those together through a cooperative model in order to, to take back the commons and redistribute that surplus in order that it can go towards clean energy um, and just transitions for, for, for everyone. Um, and, yeah, I, I appreciate these are perhaps lofty ambitions and you know, the energy sector in Australia is an extremely dirty space, um, but you know, we, ha we have a co-op now, we have a plan, we have um, six unions and two civil society organisations, two of them which come from the Latrobe Valley, Earthworker Cooperative and Voices of the Valley, um, and, uh, yeah, and a plan to, to, to start retailing electricity in the next six months. Um, I've gone over time, and I just wanted to quickly mention the Philippines example before I finish up. Um, I'll do this really quickly. So um, Centro Union Centre in the Philippines represents about 80,000 workers. 
um, including workers in the electric co-ops. The electric co-ops are essentially utilities that are responsible for providing electricity to about 60% of households in the Philippines. Um, and recently, uh, in response to attacks for, it's the only non-privatized part of the energy system in the Philippines, a country that has the highest electricity, one of the highest electricity prices in Asia, where most of that electricity is coming from Indonesian coal with a huge amount of coal in the pipeline. And a lot of pressure now that these electric co-ops are profitable with higher populations to privatize them um, and, and uh, yet yeah, put them in the hands of the oligarchs and the, and the, and the big multinationals. In response, the union's been um, undertaking a feasibility study which has shown that uh, the electric co-ops, there's 120 of, 121 of them, could embrace renewable energy generation for up to 50% of their needs. And this, this would provide a, um, a new business model for the electric co-ops, also an opportunity to provide more affordable power to households, um, and obviously it would protect good union jobs in the sector. Uh, so now the union's working to pilot that with a number of co-ops. At the same time, they're also um, working to educate end users about um, you know, the opportunity through renewables as an alternative to the dominant privatised coal-heavy um, trajectory in the Philippines. So just wanted to quickly highlight that example as a really um, exciting um, demonstration of what a trade union in our region centre is doing in this space and the opportunity to really respond to obviously the climate crisis but the, the, cli the crisis of neoliberalism and do that in a way that clearly moves away from neoliberal solutions that have uh, not been in workers' interest to a system and an energy system that is something that's uh, far better. Thanks. I'll just ask our three presenters to come up. And uh, yeah, thanks very much to the three of you. I and mean, you've got your microphones and your comfy couch there. So uh, we'll open it up to questions and comments. Yes. <laughs> OK, thank you very much um, to our great presenters. Uh, Vili from uh, Fiji. Uh, first. Uh, on behalf of the Pacific Islanders, uh, thank you very much uh, for all the great effort you are doing, um, all uh, the campaigns, uh, work you, uh, you have done. I saw yesterday from Rebecca and uh, Vanessa's presentation that you guys have achieved a lot uh, together. So thank you very much for that. But my question is, um, is about the working relationship between so many um, climate justice um, organizations, uh, international um, uh, organizations and also Australian uh, based organization. Um, how is it going? Because uh, you said, ma'am, that you are having headaches trying to find out the strategies to stop these miners. But I think the biggest head headache of all is trying to organize yourselves because there are so many of them. So, how, how is it going and what are some of the challenges? It's good for myself to go back to the Pacific uh, and say, like, these are the challenges and try to encourage our people to engage with you um, and your organizations. Thank you. Sure. Uh, probably the Stapadani campaign maybe is the best example of, uh, I think we're up to 18 organizations collectively working, uh, and some that are outside of the alliance who are taking other actions. Um, so that's an impre in a fairly short amount of time, five or six months, uh, 18 Australian, and many of them with international ties, uh, have signed up to participate and look at every angle of ways to try and challenge this coal mine. Uh, and some of that's economic and some of that's on the ground, some of it's electoral focus, the Queensland election's coming up. Um, but I think the unification around that one campaign in particular is uh, just the sheer absurdity of the size and scale of that mine, the fact that it makes no economic sense has really resonated with Australians, with organizations, and internationally. So the New York Times did a, an editorial specifically about the stupidity of the Adani mine. For, for New Yorkers to look at this and say, look, it's an example of what we can't do anymore if we're going to act responsibly on climate. Um, so I think being able to galvanize people much more quickly around big projects, similarly around the tar sands uh, in North America are, are examples of ways that organizations are working cross borders uh, to challenge these big climate threatening mines and um, take some inspiration that we're getting better at it as we go. 
Thanks, Blair. Would the other two like to make any comments? Yep, okay. Uh, another question down there, thanks. Hi, uh, Gordon Walker from, uh, from the UK, and I just wanted to reflect a little bit on our experience in the UK of transition. And we we're in this fairly, sort of fairly briefly. Yeah, 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 yeah. It will be a question. Don't worry. <laughs> just to reflect that um, we're now in the situation where we have we have got rid of our coal industry through a brutal process. I wouldn't advocate, but strangely enough, that, that we did get there. Um, it you know, started by Thatcher and a right wing government. We have got an enormous growth of renewable energy. Again, as a consequence, the liberalisation of and privatization of our energy industry again started by right-wing governments so it's that there are sort of weird contradictions and actually i suppose my question is what scope is there for you to use market-based arguments and price-based arguments because that's the most powerful thing that's going on in the uk at the moment because renewable energy is is undercutting coal by a long way away it's undercutting nuclear and it's establishing its power through a market-based logic, through enormous amounts of competition, lots of scaling up, and actually demonstrating that using a, a, you know, a classic economic argument, it's the best way to go. Is that an obstacle for you in, in Australia, or are there ways in which you can use those arguments against the ac actors who are supposedly uh, supporting market-based logics? Thanks, I'll ask. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, just, I'll start yeah. quickly and then turn over. Yeah, but I, I think it is remarkably ironic that the liberal government that proposes to be the market focused of the parties, you know, the most interested in economic outcomes, um, is actively preventing a market mechanism in this country. It, it defies all and it points to an ideology of fossil fuel obsession that is now an economic disaster for Australia because our region is taking off with renewable energies and even here at home, but what we don't have in place are structures to allow that to happen effectively for the transition that needs to happen with that to be in place uh, and with an open dialogue about the best way to go about it um, that, that interacts with, with communities and, and workers. So I think absolutely it's a big part of the solution. Uh, when you're dealing with ideologies though, it's a real challenge because they won't grasp and use that, that you know, mechanism as we should in order to make the case and get on with it. Uh, perhaps Tom, do you want to say something next? Uh, yeah, um, I think, yeah, in the, I mean, as I was talking about, like what we're trying to do with this new cooperative is um, respond to, you know, a way a lot of workers have been experiencing the energy or climate wars, whatever you want to call it in Australia, which is rising prices, um, but also messaging that doesn't speak to the things that they're experiencing every day, like putting a price on pollution, I don't think was a very effective like, frame in Australia. Um, I'm sceptical about the, um, you know, I mean, I think there's been some measures that are, you know, like the, the RET and, you know, ARENA that have, you know, that come from that initial um, Gillard package around um, renewables that you know are probably more effective than pricing carbon, um, but also yeah I think we need to look to um, public and community and worker ownership as 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 an exciting opportunity to engage new constituency and make this an inclusive transition that actually benefits um, yeah workers and 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 low income communities. Bronya, did you want to say anything? Um, one of the, I think one of the, the, the really interesting things that is happening in Australia is because the, there has been no real leadership from our, from our federal government in particular in, um, in reforming the market and, and producing those market-based incentives for, the, for a transition. Is communities just sort of d detaching themselves from the system entirely and going, well, we've got a federal government that's not going to be doing, that's not doing anything to facilitate this. So um, I'm thinking in particular of a community out in the northern New South Wales called Tyalgum, which have um, established, a, a, are in the process of establishing a little microgrid and, and disconnecting themselves completely from the national grid itself and going, well, we're just going to take the matter into our own hands and we're going to, you know, and it's a very northern New South Wales type of thing to do, but it's also been very effective for that small community. Um, 
um, who are increasingly affected by rises in, in electricity costs and that type of thing. So um, maybe perhaps in, in a traditional Australian form, people have gone, all right, well, you're not going to do anything about it, so we're going to do something about it. And the unions now are doing something about it, which is awesome. And there are other community groups in Australia that are just going, we're just going to do it ourselves and we're just going to disconnect from the grids, which is going to produce another problem later on down the track for those people who can't do that and whose communities aren't mobilised to do that type of thing. So... Um, there's, there's, there are a lot of really interesting initiatives, but it's happening within the context of a federal government that's not taking any kind of real action to allow this type of thing to happen. Um, but the companies themselves too, so AGL, and maybe you want to talk about it a little bit more because you probably know heaps more about it than I do, but AGL just sort of paving the way and going, fine, the federal government's not going to take any initiative to... to be producing any kind of reform. So um, as a major a producer of, of electricity in Australia, we're going to take our own... We're, we're, this is, we've decided that we're going to um, stop producing fossil fuel generated energy by, was it 20, 20, 2045? Um, and we're starting to invest now in renewable forms of, of energy um, production. And if you want us to, like, that's just what we're doing. So you can sit out in, in Parliament House in Canberra and, and argue about it till the cows come home, but, like, the, the, the generators themselves are just taking the initiative and going, well, this is what we're going to do. So either you're going to be with us or you're going to be sitting in your <laughs> in Parliament House fighting about it. Thanks. Got another one? Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Ruchira. My question is about... I think throughout this conference uh, and even now with this uh, panel, we have seen instances of kind of regional transition, um, and we've also seen instances of kind of you know the effects of mining and things like that. The, the interesting thing with Australia is that there are two stories of transition or not you know not transitioning. One is about kind of changing our domestic sources of energy production. The other, I think, the bigger problem is about. Um, shipping resources and the Adani mine is kind of at the center of that. So the interesting, how does a movement which is diverse and is built up over a long time and has many different strands to it, address these two very different economic approaches? And the bigger problem for Australia or a place like Queensland is mining export and Adani epitomizes that. So how does a movement gulf these two differences and kind of, you know, and yeah, work towards a common solution and transition? Who'd like to respond? Yeah, exports are most definitely the global biggest problem because it's not covered by our Paris national targets. Uh, it's expected to be dealt with at the country that buys the coal. Uh, in the case of Adani, that would be maybe India, could be Pakistan through Adani. Uh, jury is still out. But uh, yeah, transitioning your economy off of exporting fossil fuels is as least as important on the climate picture, but also on the just transition picture as the domestic policy, which in some cases, because of the cost of renewables, is almost easier. And the fact that people are opting for rooftop solar in places like Queensland is cost-driven uh, and security-driven. They want to control cost and have control over where their energy comes from and take it out of the hands of big energy companies. And that's terrific and to be applauded. But transitioning whole sectors and companies out of exporting coal, oil, and gas around the world is a bigger problem. And so it raises, I think, two really important questions. One, the desperate need for national federal leadership, uh, because that's going to take time and effort. And it's going to take some visionary approaches to how you're going to do it. Um, I mentioned the billion dollar loan that's projected to uh, potentially going to happen for Adani around the rail line. Uh, a billion dollars in Queensland, northern Queensland, could be spent on about 10 million other better things uh, than another coal mine that would open up an entirely new coal basin that's likely to become a stranded asset. So that money, dare I raise the issue of the NBN, but just putting money into a, a working uh, NBN that could provide jobs in regional locations where people could work remotely uh, would make would transform Australia potentially economically and find us a way forward beyond just digging stuff out of the ground and shipping it off. Uh, and the truth is this industry will die. It is dying. When the Financial Times runs a headline that says coal is dead, it's probably time to wake up and realize that our economic future is not in shipping coal out of Australia, and we better get some economic ideas together about how we're going to transition. Thanks, Blair. I have got a couple more questions, but does anyone want to make a brief comment in addition to Blair? No? 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your presentations. Um, so I think from the audience as well as some of the things you've said, there's a little bit too easy reliance on the promise of renewables. And I'm just wondering whether we could talk a little bit about, especially about localised renewables, which uh, kind of avoid a whole series of, 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 of subsidies that exist within the current mode of um, creating power. Um, between rich consumers and poor consumers, between regions and cities. Um, so there's that problem that when households take, um, become localised generators, they essentially opt out of subsidising um, more marginalised communities, peoples who rely on the grid and, and the cost of maintaining the grid. There's a little question about um, the production of solar panels, which have a whole series of environmental health impacts. And then a third thing about where, on whose land uh, are these renewables going to be produced? Um, so I'm just wondering how you guys are dealing with those problems, those questions, which are essentially about social and spatial injustices. Um, yeah, and how you, how you hope to think about that. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll start. I think, um, yeah, it's a really good question and I think a really important area that, um, yeah, you know, policy makers, governments and everyone needs to be engaged more in, um, in energy inequality and um, I guess, you know, blanket statements about renewables being good no matter what the political economy is behind them. Um, I think it's, you know, if you look back before, you know, privatisation, deregulation and all that jazz was, was a thing, a lot of the state utilities were doing this stuff in low income houses. Um, you know, like in the UK, for example, uh, you know, big programs of retrofitting. Um, likewise, in Victoria, the State Electricity Commission um, had a big focus on, on that before, you know, especially the aggressive privatisation in the 1990s. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's worth just remembering that, um, yeah, this is a space for community, worker, public ownership, um, and, yeah, you know, energy inequality is a massive challenge right now across our globe and also within a country like, a, you know, Australia. There was a recent ACOS um, report, I think, uh, that, that, that highlighted in, in energy inequality and how, how much it had grown in Australia. So I think the only, you know, in order to realise, you know, um, energy access and, and um, overcome, you know, this inequality, we need to look to community public and worker-owned solutions. Thanks. Uh, did anyone else want to comment or I'll take it to the next question? No? Uh, just a couple things. Uh, loads in there to work with and kind of, oh, that we could get to a point where we were having really good discussions about that part of the problem as opposed to still being so attached to fossil fuels that we can't even have that discussion openly in a way that's productive. Um, the truth in Australia is that prices going up is largely linked to privatization of the gas sector and the shipping off of gas off overshore over off seas uh, for bigger prices. Uh, so that's meant that we don't have gas at a decent price in Australia. We don't have an energy problem of not enough access, but we have a problem of privatized systems um, that are definitely making prices go way off uh, the charts for most people. And of course, we are pushing through that cost and lack of leadership issue. We're pushing people into choosing renewables in a way that's haphazard, therefore threatening a grid that is open to obviously people who will have to stay with it being uh, economically punished um, by being the last, if you were the last people stuck on the grid for their energy if they can't control, um, you know, the choice of where they're going to get it and how much they're going to pay. Um, and the infrastructure question is another one. Like, you know, the, the truth is that centralized energy is much more expensive because of old infrastructure that has to be upgraded. We're now, you know, New South Wales was staring down, spending billions of dollars on uh, upgrades of, of energy systems when in truth we didn't really need it if we had a plan for distributed renewable combination plus efficiency, et cetera. But again, all this requires planning and it's not happening at a state level, a regional level, or a national level. Therefore, we have decided literally to throw it all up in the air and wish each other good luck. And it's no way to plan for how we all have cost-effective access to energy. 
Um, and the last thing I'd say is, ironically, and it's been touched on, this is producing community energy solutions uh, that probably would not happen if we had a you know, really effective national plan. Uh, and so it's kind of great fun to watch some of these things taking off, whether it's South Australia, uh, you know, one tweet from Elon Musk shifted the debate in Australia from uh, this notion that renewables were just crazy and it was causing all kinds of havoc in the energy system to, what are you, crazy? Of course we can fix that with good renewables and a decent battery system. Uh, but all that together equals, uh, again, the great haphazard approach. So we may end up being a case study in, gee, look at that fantastic community renewables approach. It happened entirely by accident in Australia. I might just, can I quickly pick up on one thing? I think another good example, I'm bringing up Elon Musk, uh, you know, is what's happened in Puerto Rico and the current struggle in Puerto Rico now. Um, you know, I was in a meeting the other day when we were hearing from the union leaders in Puerto Rico about, uh, you know, obviously the country's grid's been decimated by climate impact, um, but privatising and, you know, the uh, union responsible for uh, energy utilities on board with going towards renewable and energy generation, but privatising the entire sector isn't in the interest, you know, obviously it's a time of desperation, but it's not in the interest of the population and the community in their, you know, long-term um, livelihoods. So I think it's really important when we, you know, come to these debates that we, we really need to consider ownership um, and, you know, what, what, that, what that means for, for communities and, and um, yeah, especially in these times of great crisis. Thanks. We've got time for one more question, and we're finishing on the dot of two, so thanks. Yeah, well, thanks, and thanks for both, uh, all three presentations. So the two tensions that I can see, real big tensions, so 350.org, um, very traditional firefighting approach in the sense of you've got to stop Adani, and I agree with that, but as I think a lot of us realize, inequality is driving climate change. That's the real problem. So there's a tension then between immediate need, and I get your point, we've got three to 10 years to do this, um, but the bigger problem is you know, inequality is a driver of climate change. And then the second tension, I think, was uh, our union organizer friend, you're the only one that mentioned just transformation as opposed to just transition. I want to see what is possible, transformation is possible. Can you comment a little bit on the tension and ask whether transition can drive transformation, or do we need to go to just transformation? <laughs> that was for you, Tom. Yeah. Good question. Uh, firefighting is only, of course, one of the things we do, and in particular in North America, we have been really active in building a movement that's quite diverse, involving Black Lives Matter, involving uh, different worker unions of various sectors, health in particular, religious leaders, uh, certainly the Stop Tar Sands kind of effort has involved traditional owners, uh, Native Americans, Native Canadians, uh, as leading that effort, uh, because it is absolutely a privatized um, system that, that disenfranchises people on their own land and uh, so of course it's a much bigger problem. Um, transformation is a great word and a word we should all use a lot more and look for the inspiration to get to it and I think some in some cases transition can lead to that transformation because it just gets us thinking in a much bigger way out of the silos of the way we've approached energy till now uh, and problem solving in general but uh, I think one of our biggest challenges is sharing inspirational examples of where things are working and how they're happening, and then how to amplify that around the world so that we can you know, adapt it much more quickly than we are, uh, and, and getting out of the silos and into a shared context of what transformation can look like and, and transition as well. Any other brief comment? Very briefly, yeah. Briefly, yeah. Um, I think... There's an exciting moment for transformation. Um, and yeah, I think it's about building, you know, strong and, um, you know, strong allies and strong movements. And, um, you know, obviously the union movement is also a broad church. I think also after, you know, the historic, you know, since this last decade, the union movement also often has looked to green growth type neoliberal solutions. You know, suddenly we're gonna flick the switch and everyone's gonna be doing all these green jobs. and 
everything, you know, everyone, you know, we won't have inequality, you know, or, hey, maybe we don't even bloody need unions, you know. <laughs> um, that sort of thing. And it's just not true. It doesn't work. Like, so I think, but also I think with the neoliberal thing, the stuff's rubbish and also we're winning the moment right now. Like, movements are winning the moment against it. We've got to seize the moment. Um, you know, you've got, like, the World Bank and the IMF saying the stuff doesn't work. The chief economist of the IMF the other day you know, said, oh, on us, why are wages so stagnant and inequality so rife? Oh, maybe it's because workers' rights. Uh, you know, maybe governments should have let, let workers collectively bargain more. Like, this is a moment of crisis. You've got fascism on the rise. Also in Australia, like the Queensland election, one nation's bearing down um, in Australia and obviously abroad. Like, it's, I think it's a moment where we really need to look to these new solutions and... Um, they need to be what's in the interests of communities. And I think, you know, like in the Latrobe Valley, which, you know, like what Voices of the Valley, the community health group's been doing, who've, you know, risen up as everyone was bloody being killed by this mine, the fire that was just allowed to burn for 45 days. Government didn't give a shit. No one gave a shit because it's a Latrobe Valley type thing. And, um, but, you know, they rose up, they're organised, and now they want, they want to be, you know, they want community ownership of renewable energy. They want to move this forward. Um, you know, Earthwork is another example down in Latrobe Valley. So I think, yeah, we need to move. We need to call out the neoliberal rubbish for what it is. And, um, yeah, and we need to urgently act on this transition, uh, you know, away from fossil fuels. Just quickly, I think um, in somewhere like the Latrobe Valley, we are seeing a hunger for a transformation because people are sick and tired of what's been happening there for so long and, and particularly after the mine fire where um, all uh, so many issues came to the fore about how um, transition has never been has, has never really been implemented there before um, and the impacts of climate change the impacts of the, the fossil fuel industry and and people wanting to shift away from that um, and there is a real hunger for it so voices of the valley for instance um, who who are, have just found out are part of your cooperative now and who've been a client of environmental justice Australia's and who we represented during the second Hazelwood mine fire inquiry um, have this incredible they call it a transition plan but Ultimately, it is a transformation plan for the region, and, and it is based on um, on transforming the electricity sector. But it it's a holistic, trans, like regional transformation plan that by f is that is so far ahead of what the local government, for instance, wants to implement in the valley. That it's quite extraordinary. So there there is a hunger for it, and there is a there is a people are ready for it. Um, and I think it's going to take the, the types of initiatives. Um, that my union friend here has been talking about, um, and other and other people have um, have been desperately trying to implement, and it, and it is, it is a, a, a transformation that, and I think that somewhere the the, the types of transformation issues that um, have come to the fore in the Latrobe Valley are potentially going to inform the way that other the other um, communities in Australia transform their approach to to trying to mitigate these types of issues. Thank you. That's a great note on which to finish. Uh, let's thank our three presenters. Thanks. <laughs>